Hello, everybody, and welcome to Planet FPL, the world where everything revolves around fantasy Premier League. My name is Serge. And my name is James. And we are recording the first of two podcasts today with correspondents where I don't have any of their players in my squad and I really feel like I should. Do you want to introduce our correspondent? Are you reflecting on the fact you've now got loads of Norwich players following the last podcast? No, no, no. None of them. <laughs> <laughs> Mark yeah. didn't do a good enough job. Of oh, I, I think Mark did quite a good job, actually. We'll talk uh, about that um, more next week. Uh, yeah. Allow me, please, to introduce to you our Leicester City correspondent, Aaron Lagor. How are you, Aaron? Yeah, I'm all right now. Uh, got over last night because uh, just after nine o'clock last night, I was in pieces, really, with what's happened. But um, yeah, I'm sure we'll get on to it. Yeah, let's let's start there. We're pre-recording on Thursday morning, uh, the night after Wesley Fofana's awful and incredibly unfortunate injury in a friendly against Villarreal. Um, let's finally put to bed the debate on how, how badly has he been underpriced and is he actually worth it as a 4.5 million asset? There's no point uh, talking about it. We were talking offline about level he- how level-headed the boy seems and he would be mentally strong enough to make a recovery, wouldn't he? Yeah, well, we obviously hope so. Um, it's it's obviously a bad injury, but um, I think he's young enough to be able to kind of get over an injury like that. It's not like he's in the latter stages of his career and he's thinking, oh, you know, it's a long way back and stuff. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure he'll come back. Yeah, fingers crossed. Serious blow. Um, I think most he was probably on the fringe of everybody's squad, wasn't he? He was either mm-hmm. in or why haven't I got him was probably everybody's thoughts. What is it? mean now and because going into game week one you're probably struggling a bit defensively aren't you all of a sudden because Johnny Evans is doubtful for game one as well isn't he yeah he is um I think that they have been looking at strengthening there anyway even you know with a fit for Farner so I think they have to go into the market now and get someone um I don't know whether they've got any irons in the fire but we we, we certainly need something because yeah Johnny doesn't look like he's going to be fit and it does leave us quite light at the back. Uh, and we've been p- playing like a four predominantly throughout pre-season. So he obviously wants to go that way. Um, so we haven't really got anyone else with the experience to just drop in there. So, yeah, we need to buy, really. What does it mean? Sienchu and possibly Castagna or Amate game week one as it stands, do you think? I suppose so. Uh, I mean, the only other thing he could do, which I, I don't particularly like, but he might drop Ndidi back in there. Yeah, he did that start last season, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, and maybe play uh, the new guy, uh, Samare. Uh, but it, it it's not really his natural position. I don't know. I'd, I'd like to think that they're going to get someone in. But even then, you, you're you looking at him just fitting straight in. And it's difficult, isn't it, week out from the season? So we'll see. Uh, Amati will have people's attention because he's 4.0. Uh, I feel like that's a, a no-go your thoughts, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, he might get the odd game here and there, but, you know, if you're getting him anyway, he's only an enabler, isn't he? But um, it, I, I, he's one of those that may not have made the cut for the 25-man squad. Um, but there's okay. A, there's a high chance that he, he'd probably be in that now. Have you got too many overseas there. players then? Or? Well, they, they obviously have to trim it down, don't they, to a certain that, degree? But that's, I think the rules are... Seven, might... isn't it? It's 25, isn't no, it? Sorry, I think. it's 25, but um, we've got two homegrown, I think. So that obviously... Yeah, homegrown under a certain mm-hmm. age, you can just include yeah. anyway. Like probably Luke Thomas is one, for example. Yeah, is um, yeah. I think you have to have eight English or British homegrown named in that 25, though, don't you? I'm pretty sure halfway through the season, you can update it, obviously, during the January transfer window and stuff. So, I mean... they. They could leave Fafana out of it, couldn't they? They probably, yeah. if if it's close, that's probably what they would do. I yeah. imagine because I think in playing before January has got to be unlikely. And it's obviously obviously unfortunately a possibility he won't play at all this season. Um, mm. So that would, I, I imagine, Armati will be in the squad. Yeah, they'd have to. I think they'd have to be additions for them to be a position where they left him out. Presume if they left him out, he'd come on loan somewhere anyway. Yeah, I mean he's decent cover. He, he never really lets us down. He's, he's obviously not. He had a, a similar really bad injury as, as well, yeah. didn't he? A couple of years ago, the, the, the day of the, the crash, unfortunately, wasn't it? I think it took him took him a year to get back as well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So he makes the issue an option. A five. I mean, he's going to, he's obviously first name on the team sheet, but 
Um, he, he is a bit of a threat from set pieces, but um, I don't know. I'd, I, you'd have to revisit it if we get someone in, because if we don't, then I wouldn't go. I, I was I was sort sort of half heartedly going to keep away from our defence anyway. Um, with the pricing, they're all a bit all over the place, aren't they? Sion Chu mm. doesn't really, no. I, I would... Five million, I mean, we've recorded pods with, uh, even when we spoke to Sam, James the Seagull, um, you'd just take Lewis Dunn, wouldn't you? Yeah, or and you've got Kufal. Kufal as five. well, potentially. There's quite a few others. And yeah. And if you had a full strength defence, yeah, by all means, I'd, I'd have a look at with Ndidi in front of them. But if you don't, then I think it's easy to avoid at those kind of prices, isn't it, really? And the only other ones that you'd look at would be the ones that can give you attacking threat as well, like Castanier or Pereira, maybe. And then it's a different decision because you're happy to take the attacking returns and maybe sacrifice clean sheet points. Uh, but again, they're 5.5 million. There's other 5.5s in Luca Dean and, and, and so on that maybe people will gravitate towards when you don't have a full strength back line. They're on the pricey side, aren't they? You know, I, I was going on. Sorry, no, sorry, no. Evans is coming at five, five point five, and I don't really understand that to be honest. That's but then Fafana came at four point five. So how did they, how did they get a million between Evans and Fafana? I guess belief, really. I know Evans. It actually worked out that I guess in the running, Evans was the one, wasn't he? Because he got a couple of goals and whatnot. So that's, but justifiable of an extra million. I mean, talking about Johnny Evans, same prices like Luca Dean and Luke Shaw's. Aaron Crespo is never going to get any interest. Yeah. I looked back at Sinchu's first season because he was very popular, wasn't he? Because he was 4.5, got in the team, 120 points, two attacking returns, 12 clean sheets. And that kind of feels like the par. Yeah. So is 120 points enough for a 5 million? Um, across the season, no. Of course, you can always say, well, look, you can buy him and sell him. Agreed. But I think at the moment you're buying him and you've got no idea his defensive partner will be. So doesn't leave Leicester in a, a great state, as you've said, Aaron, defensively going into, into game week one. What's um, what's your thinking then on the fullbacks? Who do you think is likely to start there if we're assuming? I guess it's got to be a back four now, probably. Yeah, yeah. I think fullbacks, uh, I think Pereira will start right back now. He's had, he's had a good solid pre-season. He's looking, you know, not to his best, but he's getting there. Um, Every Sky listener just went... <laughs> <laughs> Music to my ears, Aaron. Yeah, no, he's, he, he looks he looks good um, and fit um, and at it. And I think that he'll probably start with Bertrand on the left. He's he's played majority of the preseason games, um, and Castagne is obviously still not. He's he's back training with the team, um, but he's not played any preseason games. He's obviously, I think he's going to have to wear a protective uh, mask for his uh, injury that he got in the uh, Euros. So he might take a little bit of time just to ease back in. So got a good competition for places there now, haven't we? So mm. I think he'll go with, with Ricardo on the right and uh, Bertrand on the left. We've obviously got a big clue coming up because this podcast is going to go out about four o'clock on Saturday and an hour later you're playing Manchester City in the Community Shield. So there was a, <laughs> there was a big clue coming up. Um, and I think that that's really important in terms of some of my thinking of forward assets for Leicester as well. I think you saying Castagna probably won't start game at one will surprise a lot of people. Really? I, I've seen a little bit build up over the last few days within the Twitter community of people saying, mm, no one's mentioned him 3.7% owned, um, but you've just put me right off, mate. Mm, I'd be very surprised if he starts, you know, just to, to throw him in. It, you know, it wasn't a nice injury he had as well. So I, obviously I could be staying corrected, but I just, just got the, the vibe that it'll probably start with Bertrand, to be honest. What, why you, risk, it seems you, to risk him if he's not fully fully right. You think Bertrand over Luke Thomas? I do, yeah. I think it's close. I think Thomas has done well in pre-season. And again, he never lets us down when he, when he plays. Um, but yeah, I, th I think probably Bertrand just gets the nod. And it, it looks as if, I mean, it's obviously early days, but it looks as if he's struck up quite a nice little partnership with Barnes on that side. Uh, they looked quite quite good last night and against QPR as well. So let's see. Um, but yeah, I, I, that's that's where I would go. That could get no, no buy Leicester defence is what that sounds like. <laughs> I, I mean, as much as you're saying you think Pereira might start a, a, a right back, I mean, that could change by game week two, couldn't it, actually? Because 
I mean, I was beginning to have the belief that perhaps they were trying to move Pereira out of the club because I couldn't get my head around his lack of minutes. So that period where you had sort of like Southampton, Newcastle and Palace last year, where there was loads of interest in your players. Um, and I think it was after the Southampton game and he said, oh, I didn't want him to play twice in four days. And then two weeks later, he hadn't played another minute. And it was like, so so, so what, what was it? What was it? It was like suddenly he was being left out, like he was getting phased out of the team. And I didn't quite understand it because, and I know he's another one who come back from a very serious injury. Yeah. I need a right back. Like if you don't want him, Aaron, do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we spoke about it um, last time I was on uh, the pod with Ricky, I think. And we, we spoke about this, didn't we, Liddy? Yeah. I don't think he was quite up to speed. I think he, when he was playing in the team, he was obviously a lot fitter, but I just don't think his form was there. So I think he just took him out of the team just because I don't think he was on it. Um, just took him out, you know, let him have a bit of a rest and probably just sort of, you know, in the end, it was it was like a what-if season for him, isn't it? When, when's he coming back? Game week three, game week four, and it, it never really materialised. It never became an asset in the end. But um, I think that he, um, having a good pre-season is going to do him the world, and he does look a lot better. So I think it has to start right back for us. Okay. Ash Michael has got surprisingly high ownership for a goalkeeper, 13.7%. He hasn't missed a minute for three years. And I think a lot of people will remember the Euros and think, you know, actually he did play really well in the Euros and he is a decent goalkeeper. But for, for 5 million, 130, 140 points, he's probably going to pick up this year. Mm. Um, he probably just isn't a void as well if the defence isn't, isn't full strength as well, right? Yeah, and also we, we sometimes keep, uh, keep clean sheets in games where we're not expected to, and then we'll concede silly goals in games that we you'd expect us to keep clean sheets in. So, yeah, I'd avoid him. I think he's too expensive, personally. Sure. I don't think he's too expensive, I but think... I think there's just better value also, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That's maybe. Fair, but if you look at those three seasons, well, it's never less than 120 points. Um I think his best season was around about 100 and 150. 156, mm. um, which I'm pretty sure, yeah, is quite heavily influenced by the fact there's a couple of penalty saves in there, which he is capable of. So I, I feel like that return last season, 128, is probably about par 123 years ago, 156 the year before. And I think he was one where the prices came out and we spoke about it and there was no way that you could justify the 0.5 when Fafana was sitting there if you wanted less the defensive coverage. But obviously now it's not a Schmeichel versus Fafana debate if you want less the defensive. It's probably Schmeichel versus Siyunshu and the same price. Mm. So I think it does bring him back into the conversation. I think if you're comparing him, like interestingly, if you're comparing him with him and Meslier, I think like Meslier has the higher ceiling. Mm-hmm. at the same price. But then Leeds do have the 4.5 defensive options. You now, unless Luke Thomas is going to play regularly, which it doesn't look like, you now don't. So I think it does bring Schmeichel back into the conversation, actually. Whereas 24 hours ago, I, I don't think he would have been for a lot of people. No, but you've got to think that we've now got to get a centre-back in as well. I mean, it might be a different story if, um, if Evans comes back, but um, still it's... It's it, you know you don't really want to be messing around with the goalkeepers too much and there's it feels too much uncertainty back there to, to go there. If no, I get wa- that. Yeah, but the, fix, the, op- I the opening three. Yeah, yeah. Look, the opening three: Wolves, West Ham, Norwich, and then after City, Brighton, Burnley, Palace. So you've got a good seven, a really good seven on the whole. Yes, Johnny Evans is possibly going to miss game week one, but we, he's close. Like, he could make it. So there's every chance if Evan misses, get, Evans misses game week one, he's going to play game week two. If I'm making a choice on a goalkeeper, it's unless I know I'm wildcarding earlier, it's a longer-term thinking process, definitely, because you don't want to chop and change it. So if Evans misses Wolves, can, like, can I live with that as a Casper Schmeichel owner? Yeah, mm. I think I can, because a back four of... Pereira, Siyunchu, Evans, Castagne, or, or whatever alternative mm-hmm. fullback, is still a very good back four, mate. Mm-hmm. Particularly when you've got Wilfred and Diddy sitting in front of it. Mm. Yep. And we assume he's going to stay, I take it, Aaron? It's looking likely, yeah. I hope so. A, it's become a little bit of an, an in-joke, isn't it, uh, amongst a few of the Leicester fans in the, in the FPL community. 
about all these players getting linked to here, there and everywhere. And basically it doesn't, doesn't look like any of them are going to be leaving. Madison's being heavily linked with Arsenal. Mm. Apparently they have a strong interest in him. Don't think they're going to pay the 70 million for him that's being reported. And I'm not even totally convinced that Leicester would accept that money. Anyway, that's how it sounds. Mm. And Diddy, I could only see being a problem if Manchester United suddenly decided they wanted to splash the money big. He would potentially want to go, but I think he'll stay when he, and you know, I, I think he's a super player, Wilfred and Diddy. Yeah, yeah, I'm I, I'm quietly confident he, he'll be there. Um, he is very important to us, isn't he? And it, if he, if he, you know, if United rock up with with the money, um, it'd be a lot to, to prize him away from us at the moment because we know how important he is. Um, but he, if he goes into that United team, he makes them title challenges, doesn't he? Mm. I'm Depends. not sure. We'll have, Madison, to ask, we'll have to ask Gary about that. So he will probably still mm. say no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure, sure of Madison, you know. I yeah. think Madison, that from what I've seen, I think he would like a. He would probably prefer a move to Arsenal. It feels like a very Madison-y type club, Arsenal. What does I mean, that he mean? Starts, uh, just you know, all style and some substance. I wouldn't say no substance, <laughs> but you know, all style and some substance. Look at Madison, me, and it's not me getting a dig in an Arsenal. I love it. Nah, nah. But, and it's almost a dig at Madison, primarily because I've been burnt by him in FPO, and I'm 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 a guy that holds a grudge in FPO, so I won't be getting Madison regardless of where he's playing. But I do think if he decides, you know, what, Arsenal want me, um, it's not really an upwards move at all in any stretch because Leicester are by far the better team and better club at the moment. But I do feel like he'd maybe earn more money, and he might want to make make that move. Um, I'm, I'm going to avoid Madison. I can't see it though. Like they've, they've obviously um, signed up um, Smith Rowe. Smith Rowe, yeah. give him the number ten shirt. So then what? They bring in Madison, and he's the number ten, isn't he? So yeah, quite get that myself. But I, obviously, it's all hyped up on. So it's not like other things, but they haven't got yeah. Europe, so they don't need to worry about you know having a two teams as well. So they don't need to rotate their team every week to Arsenal. So do you know what? It's one of them that sounds to me, and this might bite me on the bum, but it sounds to me at the moment, unless Arsenal are suddenly going to come up with that sort of money, it sounds like the sort of news story that's good for both clubs and the player. He's the player in the media spotlight when he's had a difficult couple of years with a few injuries and stuff and not really being near the England squad in the summer where, as I think two going back a couple of years, you'd have thought James Madison will be in that squad by the time it comes around. And we know a lot of that's possibly influenced by injuries it's a good news story for Arsenal because all they're reportedly trying to spend 70 million on a player and it's a good news story for Leicester because of the high valuation it's a good news story for everybody it wouldn't surprise me if it's just complete fabrication smoke and mirrors yeah yeah I think what you said about Smith Rose spot on why, why would they have rushed to announce that he was going to be the 10 if they really wanted to buy a Leicester um, mm. buy a Madison sorry Madison. yeah no, I agree. They, they wouldn't be buying Leicester for 70 million. I think it would probably cost a, a little bit more than that. Mm. Um, do you see him as an option for you in FPL, James Madison? He's always an option. Um, he's always involved, isn't he? Um, the, the only thing I would say, and I don't know whether it will continue going into this new season, but he, he was taking a lot less corners and stuff last season. And I don't know whether that was down to the fact that He'd had this hip injury, and I think he actually got injured taking a corner. Um, so uh, we just have to watch out for that. But um, yeah, it's, it's a funny one because he had a purple patch, didn't he? Where it was kind of it was a bit unplayable, really. Um, and if he gets that kind of form back, then one hundred percent is an option. But I always talk about the the other option, Barnes, who's the same price. It just seems like uh, just seems such a better option. There's a big disparity in points per match between Barnes and Madison. I mean, mm -hmm. Barnes is at five points per game and Madison at 4.3 um, for the same price. So, yeah. In, in all fairness to Madison, he did have, um, you know, a fair bit of time, you know, injury layoff and stuff as well. So, you know, that... Yeah, there's a few Madison one-pointers in there, I bet. Mm. Yeah, coming on a sub and things like that. But, yeah, he's got he's got all the ability. Uh, just needs a bit of consistency. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's a bit of a wait and see, I think. Did Barnes play against Villarreal then? Yeah, he did. And he looked what, great. On what position did he play? Uh, he played right of sort of the three behind Vardy. So, uh, we're, so, looking, so we're looking at a 4-2-3-1 at the moment, basically. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the side that started the game last night is going to be pretty much thereabouts. You know, obviously we're out for Fana now, but that's pretty much, I think, how we'll go. Um, it, the only question mark for me really is on Perez, whether he starts Perez or not. But that, yeah, if you look at that team, um, that's, you know, providing Barnes has come through these these couple of friends okay, then um, he'll start, I think. So Barnes right, who left? Uh, so Bar- Barnes left, uh, Perez right. Okay. And um, Madison. Madison in the middle, Vardy up top. Yeah. So the the players that we really want to know a bit more about are the two new boys and Ian Acho, and none of them are in the team. So Yeah. I know. I mean, they they've looked good in preseason and Daka looks Daka looks a player. Um, you know, good finisher, took his goal well against QPR in the friendly, um, looks sharp. Uh, but I think they're not just gonna throw him in. I think he might be used as as a guy to maybe give Bart Vardy a bit of a rest here and there, and um, yeah, it looks good though. And and um, Samare looks good as well. Uh, really clever player on the ball, doesn't ever look flustered in possession. Um, yeah, Ianacho is a funny one because it it almost feels as if it's very harsh in him not to start the season with how he finished it. But I just think it just in terms of the formation, it doesn't think it quite fits it. Um, but I guess we'll see. He's he's, a, he's one that you can't really risk at the start, and I, I really wanted to put him in, but I, I don't I don't know whether he'll start the first game. Uh, thanks, Aaron. That's brutal because I haven't looked <laughs> at my FPL team for about <laughs> ten days, legitimately. I know what it is, but I haven't chopped and changed it. And I, I do know it had two forwards in it called Ollie Watkins and Kaleshi and Asho. So it really is <laughs> really is at the fucking drawing board for me, mate. Mm. At least you've got quite a lot of options in and around that price change to go to. Um, I'm just interested as well in terms of who out of the two. So if you're playing one up top, then one of Ianacho and Daka's your backup striker to Vardy, who's ahead in the pecking order. If Daka's been bought in for, for reasonable money and he's looking sharp, but Ianacho is the one who's got the experience. I'd be interested to see. I mean, is, is Daka a long-term Vardy replacement, do you think? Does he have the pace to get in behind and do a lot of the similar things that Vardy does? So we're kind of, we say it every year, how long is Vardy going to keep going for? And he keeps doing it. But long-term now, do we think that Pat, Pat Sandak is the guy that can fill his boots? Well, I saw James nodding now. So he's certainly got the mm. pace. That's why I was nodding to the pace, yeah. He's just been, blistering. Yeah, he's lightning and he's... he's a, Obviously, his record speaks for itself. I know it's in the Austrian league, but he's, he's he knows where the goal is. Um, so, I guess in terms of that mould, he, he does fit it. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that if that's how they go. But uh, he certainly certainly looks a good prospect. Yeah, listen, look in in any league, fifty one goals in two seasons should not be sniffed at. I say any mm-hmm. league, but you know what I mean. It's, it's yeah. Austrian. It's not the San Marino yeah. league. With I'm trying to think of a country I can't offend. So just San, Marino, <laughs> San, San Marino shouldn't be too bad. Sorry to the San Marinoists out there. Didn't they win a gold, uh, a bronze medal at the Olympics? Anyway, um, yeah, fifty one goals in two seasons in Austria. I think gives you a little bit of a story. And if you look at the kind of highlights package of some of his goals. He's breaking exactly that. The sort of mm. goals you expect Vardy to score are the sort of goals that Daka scores. Mm. So I think, yeah, there is a potential there for him to be the long-term replacement. It doesn't surprise me that he's unlikely to start the season. Uh, what you're saying about Ian Acho does surprise me. Really? Mm. Yeah, obviously, he's sitting in a fucking team, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> it does surprise me, yeah. <laughs> Any thoughts on Vardy? 10.5? He's too expensive. He's he? going to be the top scorer in the first three game weeks. So you know that. Consistent <laughs> though, the guy. I mean, 187, 210, 174, 183. Okay, 161 where he missed a few games. 211. I mean, he's not dropping below 180 points ever. No. So consistent that guy. He is. He is, and he's obviously on pens. Um... Yeah, it's a funny one. I think he's just a bit too expensive, personally. I guess it all depends on your structure again. But, you know, sorry to say this, James, but if Kane does go to City, he's the only really guy at that premium price that you would have, I think, up top. Um, Because no one's really going near Aubameyang, are Well, that's why I think is one reason why Jamie Vardy is very interesting. First Mm. thing, 
29 attacking FPL returns last season. Jamie Vardy. 15 goals, 14 assists. Now, yes, quite a few of them were penalties very early in the season, but that's not a joke, right? He's pulling in an attacking return at roughly around about every 98 minutes or so. Extremely good. You have three good opening fixtures on a whole, I think. None of them are particularly easy. Wolves at home, West Ham away, Norwich away. And there are a couple of unknowns amongst them. But as three fixtures, he's quite decent. And if you want to hold the money back for Kane, if he moves, or Lukaku possibly, having Jamie Vardy in there to start with will leave you a lot closer. And that's why I think he's really interesting as well. I wouldn't rule out... Well, based on what you're saying, Aaron, I wouldn't rule out starting with him. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would, it, would, it would come into my thinking now. If you're saying that's the system you're going to play, I think he personally as well works better as a one... He's a, he's a loner, isn't he? He's got to be. If he's drinking port and red Bull prior he's, to games, he's, yeah. he's, he's got to be a bit of a loner, isn't he, right? So... Um, I don't I, have I, any stats, James. You might know just from your encyclopedic memory but those 14 assists is a big jump up was he creating and getting more assists when he was playing as a two with Ian Acho? yeah does that affect his assist count if he is one well more creative with a partner less of a scorer I think with a partner so, but I think for so him his goal count was down what what you want for 10.5 million forward he's not him to be laying on assist every other week for Ian Acho. you want yeah. him to be scoring every week you want him to be in plus five every week or so on average. The, the thing with, with uh, when you mentioned the three in behind Barnes, Madison and Perez, they, and then Tielemans to add into the mix as well, they'll create chances for that guy. He, he's, got, he's got people creating the chances for him as well. Sometimes uh, Aubameyang, for example, he struggles because they weren't creating enough chances maybe necessarily, but Vardy's going to get chances and he's clinical. Yeah. Talking ourselves into Jamie Vardy here. I don't have well, the money. Well, it, I don't honestly, know who I'm going to have to sell no, to try and get I'm it. just thinking out loud, and it's really difficult with us pre-recording these and not knowing what's going to happen. But just before we start recording with Aaron, and we've got Ted for on for the Chelsea pod next, it's beginning to look like Lukaku to Chelsea is going to happen. Mm-hmm. And that, when you think of Chelsea's fixtures, even game week seven onwards, you're going to want a piece of that. And we spoke about a Chelsea captaincy option during that period, where if Lukaku goes there, it's going to be him. So suddenly you really have got to start thinking, how am I going to get to, if you're not wildcard in pre-game week seven, for example, how am I getting premium forwards in? And what do you want to do with your team if like, Kane and Lukaku are both going off like they're capable of going? And then I think, yeah, Jamie Vardy is there sitting there ready all the way through because he's got good fixtures bar Man City in game week four, which is a club that actually, traditionally, he's done quite well against individually playing up front on his own. So I think, truthfully, it's interesting because I think 10.5 million for Jamie Vardy is is probably now too much. Mm. But he might still be a good player to start with, ironically. It's the captaincy as well, isn't it? Like You've got to really want to put the armband on him at that kind of price. And he does, he would definitely give another alternative for game week three because he's Norwich away. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, game game week three is one where there's a lot of options. Having him... If you want the Leicester option, if he's going to start, it's going to be him, isn't it? It's not going to be Ian Acho. So having him there would give you an alternative for those who are looking to go against Bruno and Man City at the start, for example, with Liverpool playing Chelsea. Vardy offers an alternative to Kyung Sun, for example, versus Watford. By the time you get, you'd maybe go for Vardy, depending on how it looks when you got there. Yeah, suddenly he would be back on my radar, even though, as I said, I, I think 10.5 is probably overpriced. Yeah. See, he was 10 last year, wasn't he? Yeah, he finished the um, season at 10.2. So 10 sounds probably he did start at right 10, yeah. Mm. But then when you look at when you look at those returns, it's justified. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's Definitely. justified. The only reason they wouldn't have been putting him up in price really is because of his age. But uh, so almost every summer since we started, we've done it all the time. We've said, he's still I wonder. Mm. And then guess what? This year I'm saying. Do you know what? Might start with a bastard. He's going to flop, mm. isn't he? He's, he's, he's always one of those that gets a mention when it comes back from pre-season as well. Like He's always the top of all the running stats and all that sort of stuff in pre-season. So he's, he's not losing it. He's... Nah. Well, the one, uh, the one thing he has is that mentality is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. 
I just, I, I'm, I'm imagining all of these Twitter teams that had Salah Fernandez's son and are now going to have none and have Kane Lukaku Vardy up top, thinking, yeah, there's a reason why. No, you no one's, no one, no one's four weeks before the. No uh, one is going to end up with Kane Lukaku Vardy. That's not going to happen. But I think Vardy could be a good holder for one or the other two, potentially. The irony of us talking about Vardy being a placeholder for two players who haven't even moved yet. Yeah. It's interesting. And of course, if you decide you don't want to go down that route or the players don't move, there's obviously plenty to come down to. And it gives you a, a, a couple of, I think particularly the Norwich game, maybe game week three, a couple of alternatives for captaincy. What can you tell us, Aaron, about uh, Samare then? Bubakari. Well, um, I won't profess to know a lot about him, you know, before we signed him. Um, but from what I've seen in pre-season, he looks a real player. Uh, he's, yeah, he's got he's got a lot of ability, uh, great balance. Um, you know, he's quite a big, you know, guy. He's probably sort of similar sort of size to to Ndidi, really. But he's a very elegant type of player. Um, gets himself out of tight situations quite well, and um, yeah, he looks a real, real, um, real good signing for us. So, Central midfielder, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess he could. He, he plays probably more, um, slightly more advanced than what indeed he would. Uh, maybe more of a Tielemans type type role, but he, he could definitely looks like he could play in a double pivot. Double pivot, um, and we, you know, it'd be a fairly decent backup there. He's obviously not the same type of player in indeed, but he could probably fill in there and do a job if if we did lose him. So it looks quite versatile, and uh, yeah, impressed with what I've seen so far even though it's obviously been minor in um, pre-season. I think you've made a couple of impressive additions again. I think that's an, an important one. If he's going to be a stronger uh, backup than Papis Mendy, if you yeah. lose and did he for a period. Um, and is Tielemans back or not? Yeah, he's back. He's, he's back. back. Did he play last night? Yeah, he started last night and he, he actually started against QPI in the previous, the previous game, previous friendly. So he probably got about... Uh, I think he got an hour in that game and played about an hour again last night. So, uh, no, he came up at half time last night. But um, yeah, it looks good. Six point five too much or other better six point five options? Uh, other six better six point five options, but um, he's one of those where he'll tick along. And uh, you know, if Vardy is starting to get the drawn in games and stuff, he, he's kind of next in line for pens. So, and and obviously. True. Got a few last last season um, when Vardy was off the pitch. So, um, and he takes a lot of set pieces as well. So he's got having used the point. So he's not he's not worth completely forgetting about. But I'm, uh, I'm trying to think back to have a conversation. This time I want to check. Okay, off you, was, you left us hanging completely. <laughs> yeah, no, no, Santa I was just saying. Uh, I was Ooh. looking at Tielemans. It was like three years ago was eight attacking returns. Last uh, the year after that was nine. Last year was 10. So mm. he's on an upwards trajectory that this year he's going to get get 11 or more. Mm. Um, yeah, at six and a half, I do. I, I, Tielemans is one of those. If you want to leave him as a set and forget, then yeah. I don't think he's a bad shout at all. The likes of Rafinha um, might be more explosive at the same price, but um, you may find that Rafinha ends up being someone that you want to take in, take out of your team, depending on who leads it playing. And if you don't want to mess about with your transfers and you want to limit them to just maybe swapping around your premiums or something like that, then, then Tiedemans is, is, is such a good shout to have in there. He he'll play. Good. If he's fit, he'll play. Simply. Oh, 100%. I just think it's difficult to predict his points sometimes in games. Yeah. But yeah. he's very consistent. I think that's why he's a bit of a season keeper if you're going to get him in there. But yeah, he will play. If he's fit, he'll play. I mean, he, I think he missed half an hour of the whole season last year. So yeah. very consistent. Who's, which Leicester players are in your squad then at the moment as it stands? In my FPL squad, mm. <laughs> uh, none actually. Um, well, join, join me then. Join the club. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I have sort of tinkered with and had Fafana in there and stuff, but obviously that's that's a no go now. But um, Barn, Barnes is tempting me from what I've seen in only the the snippets of um, you know he played played uh, an hour yesterday and forty five minutes against QPR and he looks sharp. He looks kind of you know, almost at the level he was when he got the injury. So, um, yeah, he's one to keep an eye on. He, he might sneak into my squad before game week one. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, I've got a 6.5 and a 6 million midfielder in there in Rafinha and Saar, and I have no money 
This is my problem right now yeah. is that all my money's tied up with Salah, Son, Trent and Robbo. Um, and they're my big hitters at the moment. And to, to then find the money to get to Harvey Barnes yeah. isn't there. But I don't understand why, because I think you'll finish fifth or sixth in the league and you'll do well. And yeah. so really, I should be at least picking up one or two Leicester, Leicester players. Yeah. Did yeah, you find just, your, your data, James? Uh, yeah, I did. What I wanted to check was Tielemans' two penalties were very late in games against Man City and Leeds. I wanted to check when Ian Acho was on the pitch. Uh, he was on the pitch against Man City. He wasn't against Leeds. But yeah, that, as Aaron said, that would suggest that if Vardy's not going to play, Tielemans probably would be on the pens rather than Ian Acho if Ian yeah. Acho's on the pitch. That's what Yeah, I well, um, also another thing in pre-season is um, Ian Acho took a penalty. Uh, whether anyone saw that uh, in the QPR game. But Tielemans again was off the pitch, so I'd be surprised. And he actually took one Palace. In the first preseason game and skied it completely over the bar. Oh, so. Ian Acho. Yeah. And yeah. he missed in the league at Palace when you played a heavily rotated team as well. Yeah. I say missed, the Gator, I mean, it was Gator saved it, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think for myself, the most likely Leicester player I'm, I am to start with now is Vardy. Um, I wouldn't rule out Kasper Schmeichel because I think that's possibly opened up actually where just a, and I don't want to fuck about with that position. I know he's solid and consistent and I think five is not, it's definitely not overpriced. It might be underpriced. Um, defensively, I don't think I can start with. Midfield, I'd really like Harvey Barnes, but I'm, I'm a little bit conscious of what Brendan Rodgers said after your game at QPR that he definitely was not 100% fit yet which does make me think, although there's explosiveness in him, there's every chance there could be a couple of one-pointers from him mm-hmm. in the first few games. And based on what you're saying on Vardy and the system, that appeals. Vardy as a single striker appeals to me more than he does in a partnership with someone else. So I think that would be back on the radar. I don't think that I would start with him. And i say right now, I'm probably unlikely to start with any Leicester players uh, but a little bit like what we said with Manchester United and that possibly being my stance there. But I don't think that's right, Serge, because even though the, there's question marks defensively, those opening fixtures, the opening seven, are very good for Leicester. And they're look very at that, capable I mean, of starting yeah. really well. I think when I look at Leicester's fixtures, I think they're all right all the way up to game 19 because it's only one or two. You get you don't have back-to-back difficult games and then you go on a run of nice a nice run of two or three I mean, even um, the FPL site showing West Ham as a red fixture. That's it's not red; it's grey at worst. Um, and then you've got Man City and Man United, but there's a three-game gap in between, which is Brighton, Burnley, Palace. Um, you've got Chelsea, but you've got a three-game gap, which is Brentford, Arsenal, Leeds in between that. I, I just think it's good all the way up to to game week eighteen, nineteen. Um, so someone like Schmeichel, sit and set and forget, is decent. Yeah, I'm not going to rule that out now. I'm not mm. going to rule that out at, at, at all. And what would be really interesting is for those who are listening, as soon as the pod's gone out, they'll probably know by this point, check your phones, guys, the Leicester team against Manchester City in the Community yeah. Shield. Yeah. And there's more clues. And obviously, if Aaron's got this all completely wrong, then we all look like dickheads at the moment. <laughs> and, 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 and Ian Acho's never left the draft when Vardy's sitting on the bench and stuff like that. The only thing that you've got to be careful of is if, obviously, this this injury to Pafan is a big one. Um, is if he then decides to change the system. I don't I can't see that, but obviously he's done it in the past. And you don't have enough centre backs to play three at the back. No, but it, it never usually stops him. We've yeah, spoken about this in the past, haven't we? Um if he wants uh, to play it, he'll play it. Well that's what I mean. He, he might drop Sun Chu in and then might drag Bertrand in and then maybe Castan. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Just just something to think about. Obviously the, the weekend will tell us. Um, a lot. I've seen Brendan Rodgers play stranger back threes than Castagne, Cianchu and Amati. I've definitely seen stranger ones than that. So Morgan Bennett and... Uh, ah, it's my my favourite of them two, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel so horrible when it, any criticism of Wes Morgan always feels absolutely terrible after what he achieved of you. But uh, yeah, we highlighted that back three you finished the previous season with was invisible, <laughs> mate. Um, but well sorted now. It's just, it's unfortunate that Last year, is like the whole season was hampered by injuries. And it feels like you're here again. I mean, when mm. are we expecting James Justin back? 
Uh, he's a bit of a way off yet, I think. I don't think you'll see him until maybe, I don't know, October, November at the earliest. Yeah. I'm sure we'll talk about him when he does because another really developing player, hopefully he recovers to some of the form that was making him an FPL asset that I watched go past me nearly every game week for the first half of last season. I'm worried mm. about Leicester, how they're going to play. I'm not worried about it this time. I, I, I believe you, Aaron. What you say goes as far as I'm concerned <laughs> till I see that team on Saturday. Yeah, we should see. <laughs> any, any, how do you feel about breaking into the top four this year um, just because of how the others have strengthened? And yeah, well, we've tried it last couple of seasons and not done it, have we? So, tried it. You've been in for about 60 <laughs> weeks, mate. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's going to be difficult this year. Yeah, I think it's it, it almost feels as if that you know they've all strengthened, haven't they? Um, it's going to be difficult. I mean, you know, last season I think I said look, we, you know, I thought we'd finish top eight, and obviously we did comfortably. Um, but you know, we've got to be aiming top six again. We, in the end, we had a great season, uh, although it obviously fell out on the last day of the game, but. Yeah, top four is going to be very difficult. To so you're hoping top down. six, you'd be happy with that. And another cup, why not? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for I think anybody... That, that kind of little consistency of kind of keep putting a trophy in, you know? I think I for anybody... At the, for a second. I was saying the, am yeah. I back? Sorry. Yeah, you are now. I think for anybody yeah. to finish... A, um, anybody outside the big four to expect to finish in it at the moment is unrealistic. Yeah. Um, but as I've said to you on other pods, Serge, I think at the moment that Leicester are the best equipped to be closest to Ken. Yeah. Um, and I think it's right to say, actually, with the expectations of the football club are beginning to change. Start thinking of yourself as a top six club because you are better than two, two of the so-called big six, in my opinion. And actually think if you didn't finish in the top six this season, that would be disappointing unless... You went extremely deep in the Europa League, for example. Yeah, which, and which you the, may the, well do. Yeah, we the, need the kind of cup goals. wins help as well. Um, because if I look at Arsenal, despite their being um, being in a bit of disarray, just the odd the FA Cup every now and then and what have you, just keeps the trophy cabinet ticking along rather than building up a 20 or 15, 20, 30 year gap of no trophies. It might just be a League Cup or a FA Cup or, or what have you, but it's something. Every three or four years, if you whack something in the cabinet, people people think, all right, decent. And so I think a good cup run or cup win, mm. it, it shouldn't be sniffed at as well. Yeah, I think um, this is where Brendan has done quite well since he's come into the club. He's always taken the cups really seriously. Yet other managers have come in and played weakened teams. And obviously the, the incentive is then just to finish as high in the league. And, you know, I think you, need, you do need to take these cups seriously because, um, you know, they mean a lot to the fans and stuff. So... Yeah. yeah, we did. We did a pod last week, Sir on on Patreon, which I know Aaron listened to as well. Um, on the playoff finals in the championship yeah, yeah. in the nineties, yeah, 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 yeah. and Leicester featured in four in five years. Were a big part of that story. Having one, I think mean, you lost three of those uh, four as well. Um, the, it's well documented how the club has progressed. Obviously, after the title win, they had a big flirtation. We're going straight back down again, and you think, well, oh, it really was just a one-off miracle. But I think we've seen now that like the owners, the sustainability of the club, the way it works in the transfer market, they're ready to push on. The problem is the, the ceiling. You were in there, mate. You've been in there for like all of the last two seasons and not not punched it. Yeah. Um, it is also even harder to stay there once you have punched it once as as well. But you'll be on the fringes. You'll be close again, mate. You've got a very good side. Yeah. 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 We just need a centre back now. I got a few of them if you want as well, mate. <laughs> the Spurs clear out continues. Um, yeah, Aaron, thank you so much for your time. Once again, do you want to plug your Twitter? Just so any of you listeners who uh, haven't listened to us before know where they can find you tweeting about Leicester and so on and so on. Yeah, just at Aaron, at Aaron Lager. Um, Simple L-A-P-L. as you like. Yeah. Linked everywhere as well. And that all he's hiding behind FPL accounts, man puts himself straight out there. Straight like if he fucks <laughs> up, that's it, job gone, everything, mate. <laughs> Aaron, always a pleasure. James, where are we going to next? We're going to the bridge, are we? Yeah, we are going to speak to Ted Moore about Chelsea.
Good. Well, let's just have a quick hit refresh on the breaking news and see if Lukaku has signed before we record the podcast. So that one doesn't go out of date as well. We'll, we'll uh, discuss the, 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 the for and against. Yeah, we will indeed. Um, so wherever you're listening to the podcast, make sure you're subscribed. Only four more left to go in Correspondent Week. Well done if you've managed to get through uh, all 16 so far. Stay safe. Ciao for now. Thanks, Aaron. Be nice to each other, everyone. Cue music, please, man, Charles.